So I uh, want to welcome everyone to, who is joining the meeting today. You're all very welcome. And I know I'm looking forward to today's meeting. I'm sure members will have lots of questions for those uh, joining to, to brief us from the Transport and Road Asset Management. Uh, I don't think we have anybody in the public gallery today. Um, but uh, if members are content, we'll proceed through the agenda as follows. So I don't think we have any apologies today. Um, declarations of interest to remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest which might reasonably be thought by others to influence their approach to the matter under consideration. Any members who have interest to declare in relation to today's business should do so now or when the particular matter arises in the meeting. So does any members have any interest they wish to declare? No. So I just see there's a few who've joined us in the public gallery. Just a few um, things to run through. Um, you can use your mobile devices through uh, a Wi-Fi connection. All devices should be muted. Uh, password details are available on the gallery rules and anybody wanting to connect to the assembly's Wi-Fi, um, 3G or 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So you're very welcome uh, to our meeting. Draft minutes, uh, item number four, draft minutes at page seven. Uh, there's a draft mi minutes of proceedings for the meeting on the 21st of February, 2024. Uh, I want to seek agreement from members that you're content. The minutes are a true and accurate reflection of the meeting on the 21st of February, 2024. All members content? Great. Okay, I'll sign the minutes. Okay, item five is matters arising. At page 23, uh, the matters arising from the meeting on the 21st of February 2024. Uh, can I ask members to note and if they have any issues they want to raise arising from the meeting? All members content then? And at page 27, there's outstanding committee requests for information and for noting. So all content, yep. Yeah. And then we have correspondence. Uh, again, we've received a number of invitations from a broad range of groups. Um, so at page 98, there's a request from Belmont Strategy on behalf of ABO Wind to brief the committee chairperson on a range of issues. So I just want to seek agreement to schedule evidence from ABO Wind to the Forward Work Programme for scheduling at a later date. All content? At page 153, there's a request for, from the Association for Consultancy and Engineering to brief the committee chairperson on a range of issues. And I just again want to seek agreement that we schedule uh, the evidence session from them uh, to the forward work programme for a later date. All content? Yep. Yep. At page 154, there's a request from Pivotal to brief the committee on a range of issues. And again, I'm just seeking agreement that we schedule for a later date. The committee all content? Great. At page 155, with the request from the Mineral Products Association Northern Ireland Limited to brief the committee on a range of issues. And again, seeking agreement uh, that we schedule this briefing for a later date. All content? Uh, if members are content, I want to seek agreement just to go into a uh, closed session because we have items of correspondence from two members of the public. Um, and just to protect their details, I would like to go into closed session if members are content. Read. Read. Okay. Okay. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound.
Committee Room 29, signed. 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 Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Okay. So, uh, I just members want to seek agreement to all the remaining actions as per the correspondence memo, which you will see in your packs. All content with that? Indeed. Just yep. one, uh, one chair. In terms of the correspondence from the Minister around his intention to make a written statement to the Assembly. I note that the written statement was embargoed for 10am on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I just wonder procedurally, is there any issue around embargoing something to a day that's not a, 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 that it's a Sunday, basically? Yeah. It's, it's more, um, uh, I suppose the, uh, the, the requirements for a written statement came out on Friday. The Minister is obviously signalling his intention to the Assembly to do that. The embargo really is more, I suppose, from the point of view from the press and reporting on that. Um, but um, I don't see anything procedurally. No procedural. Yeah, so I know you can embargo a press yeah. statement. but that, That's effectively where we are. It's, it's up to them to decide their embargo. Um, it's an odd timing, but th there's really nothing procedurally around that that's a, a mess. Yeah. But it, it is unusual. I think it did raise 
my eyebrows and never seen it, but yeah, it it was quite odd the timing. But uh, and I'm sure whenever we come down, it's a good statement. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> certainly welcome it. The <laughs> chair, chair would suggest that there was planned media that this was coinciding with. That that would suggest why the timing was unusual. Um, but there's no procedure. Well, sure. Mark used to do it when he was the minister as well. He was uh, <laughs> all good statements. Yeah. I'll just tweet it. So, uh, just <laughs> all members content with them with the rest of the correspondence and happy to, to note it. Really? Yeah. Okay, so we'll now move to um, agenda item seven, which is an overview of the Transport and Road Asset Management Group here coming to the committee today to, to brief us. Uh, you will see at your packs at page uh, 263, we have the overview um, paper from the Transport and Road Asset Management Group. And at page 6 on your table papers, you will see the clerk's brief. So I just want to seek agreement from members that the evidence is recorded by Hansard. All members content? Then. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Um, and today we uh, welcome Colin Woods, who's the Deputy Secretary for Transport and Roads Asset Management Group, Sean Kerr, Director of Transport Planning and Policy, Colin Sykes, Director of Road Asset Management, and Leon McAvoy, Director of Road Asset Development. You're very welcome to the committee this morning. I know members are very uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you today um, and giving us an overview. I know members will probably have quite a lot of questions that we'd like to get through today. Um, so I'll allow you, yourselves to brief us and then we'll, we'll ask questions then after that. <coughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thank you to you and the committee for the chance to come along here today. Um, so you've introduced us already, so I'll not repeat that. Um, but if I may, I'd like to start just by giving you a brief overview of the group's work. And then very happy to take the questions, and I know there's a number of areas that members have expressed an interest in. A lot of the work of Tram Group is the responsibility we have for maintaining, managing and improving the road network to keep it safe and effective and reliable. And we recognise that our road network is a real asset and an enabler for, for lots of things in society. And in fact, it's Northern Ireland's most valuable infrastructure asset worth over £30 billion. It extends to 26,000 kilometres of road. There's almost 10,000 kilometres of footways, almost 6,000 bridges, and 290,000 streetlights, among lots of other things. So the scale of what we manage is, is, is really big. Uh, we repair it, and we make it safer for road users and pedestrians, for example, by delivering our gridding services in winter or improving sight lines at junctions. We expand the network through new road schemes or bypasses, and we manage the traffic that uses it. And we repurpose it to accommodate changing travel patterns and demands, and, and we recognise the key role that the road network plays in enabling lots of other things, not least public transport uh, and, the, and the bus network that, that's provided. We also provide parking and blue badge services, which we know are matters of, of great significance um, for the public, and we advise on planning applications. And as we do this, we aim to protect and enhance our natural heritage and minimise our, environment, our environmental impact where we can. The group's also responsible for the development and production of a transport strategy for Northern Ireland, and the suite of transport plans that will support it, as well as a broad range of other policy areas, many of which, as you would expect, are focused on the need to decarbonise how we travel. Increasingly, we're also planning for the transformation of Northern Ireland's active travel infrastructure as a contribution to the health and well-being of society and to support a shift away from private cars that can reduce congestion and help the environment. And we know that our staff are often a key part of local communities and are often the first port of call for elected representatives and members of the public who have issues to raise about the road network. That, that's a very quick overview of what we do, and you'll appreciate that the work of the group, in common with much of the department, underpins the whole programme of government. Um, a reliable transport network is an implied assumption in every public service and supports the day-to-day -day functioning of society. And we know that as a department, some of the constraints we operate under I mean, we can't always meet the expectations or desires of everyone who uses that network, but we're well aware of the significant interest that, that people have in the things and projects we're responsible for. I'd like to briefly touch on matters of finance and staffing, if I may, uh, and then happy to take any questions. The financial challenges facing the department won't be news to the committee. 
Um, in 23-24, Tram Group was allocated a capital budget of £184 million, and the Minister has recently taken a number of decisions to increase this with additional allocations for structural maintenance. Independent analysis that the Department produced in 2018 tells us that about £192 million is needed every year to maintain the network to the right level. And so it's no surprise then that when there's a shortfall in funding, there's less maintenance over a prolonged period, which means that the quality of the road network can struggle uh, to, be, to be sustained. The capital budget for the group also covers the development of strategic road improvement schemes like the A5 Western Transport Corridor and a range of other essential functions like our fleet replacement, safety upgrades, bridge strengthening, things like that. From a resource perspective, the group's allocation last year, this year was just over £159 million, which includes £35 million for essential maintenance of the road network. That covers many of the safety-related impacts uh, and aspects of our work, surface defects, grass cutting, road markings and the maintenance of road signs. And you may well be aware the Department operates a limited service standard on essential maintenance, which means that only the most serious defects get addressed. And we don't do that because we want to or because we think it's sound engineering practice. We do it simply to ensure that the budget we have can last for the full financial year so that we still retain the ability to respond to emergencies, um, significant weather events and so on in later months. From a people perspective, it's a genuine privilege to lead the people who work in the group, a workforce whose expertise and professionalism under challenging circumstances does them great credit. And this work often goes unseen, but as you've heard and as I'm sure you'll know, it's absolutely critical to, to the functioning of society. We have just under 1,400 people in the group in a mix of administrative, industrial and professional and technical roles, which are mainly but by no means exclusively civil engineers. In common with many public services, we have a large number of vacancies, somewhere in the region of 28% or 475 vacancies, which puts a lot of pressure on the organisation, as you can appreciate. The majority of those posts can't currently be funded, um, and we also face some challenges around our ability to recruit new people. So work to ensure that we can retain and build the capacity and capability that's necessary to discharge all of the statutory and other duties that we have will continue to be a really high priority for the group over the next few years. So in closing, we're looking forward to working in support of the Minister and, and to, to engage with the committee throughout our work. Um, we're very happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, and we're looking forward to working with you too. Maybe you'll not think that after these questions today, but um, we really appreciate your time and coming to the committee today. I'm just going to kick off with a few questions um, a few members have already indicated. Um, firstly, we have had the Northern Ireland Audit Office report this week, um, and it was particularly damning in relation to procurement of key infrastructure pro projects and obviously it doesn't instill very much public confidence whenever people are looking towards the A4, the A5 and they see the likes of a report like that coming out. And I suppose, I'm not sure if you can comment at this stage, but um, would you like to provide any comment on that particular report? And indeed, if there is any work ongoing to try and sort out some of those issues already that have come to light? <coughs> So the, the Department of Finance will be in the lead for the civil service, but in terms of the work that we have been doing already and will continue to do, we, we recognise the challenges that there are in, in building major projects in particular. They're, they're large, complicated things, and there's an awful lot of detail that needs to be managed. One of the constraints I, I refer to is, is the capacity of the department, um, and we, we recognise that one of the areas that you can start to see that impacting delivery most visibly is in our major project delivery. So. We are looking very carefully at the suite of major projects that the department has, and certainly within Tram Group, and making sure that as each of those projects advances <coughs> through its design and development and procurement and tendering and delivery, that we're matching the resource levels that we need before we take the decision to, to move it forward to the next step. There, there are other things that I'm sure the Department of Finance will, will want to share in general about how we might respond to that. and I know. As you say, there have been a number of reports over the years, so I, I think the answer for now is to, to study that report is, is what we're doing. And I've read it once um, since it was published, but obviously there will be a lot more studying to do, and we recognise the importance of, of delivering major projects well and effectively. I suppose just on the back of that, um, the Irish government stated in its press release um, that subject to the completion of statutory processes, um, and secure enough funding, a decision to proceed with construction, this is on the, the A5, um, would commence at the end of 2024. 
Um, I mean, how realistic do you think that that is? You know, does the department share this view on the suggested timescale that the work could commence? Because the end of 2024 is coming pretty quick. Yeah, so you, you'll have heard the Minister speaking in the Assembly and publicly about the importance that he attaches to the delivery of the A5. So uh, I can certainly say that we're working very hard to progress it as effectively uh, as we can. Um, we're considering the, the Planning Appeals Commission report from last year and the Minister will, will consider that and take a decision on the way forward in the coming months. Okay. Um, just to suppose a more general question in terms of management, maintenance and improvements. Um, all of us around this table, obviously in our own constituencies, we drive the roads every day, particularly myself and for Man and South Drone. Um, how does the department prioritise its responsibilities within these areas? So um, are, are there areas which are typically lower priority? Um, and how, what's the impact um, on the road network? Because obviously you have the end user results. So can you sort of detail to me what's the list of priorities within that management, maintenance and improvements? Well, yes, certainly I, I take the, the maintenance question, if that's okay, Chair. Um, as Colin has said, we, we do operate currently under what we call limited limited service when it comes to maintenance. This means that we, we generally will only fix the highest priority uh, defects on the road network, whether that's potholes or, or cracking, um, other, any other sort of surface defects that, that we come across. The, that, that maintenance policy is very much based around traffic volumes. Um, the, the, the category of the road that that needs to be repaired uh, and factors like that. Therefore, we we will we will tend to prioritise those higher risk areas um, where where there's more likely to be a road safety implication. Uh, you know what the outworkings of that mean that, that will generally be sort of the main the main road network. The the high traffic roads will get the the greatest attention when it comes to sort of def repairing defects. Uh, again, those defects need to be of a certain size um, before we will. We will take an intervention, and and the speed at which we will take take those repairs forward is also based on the category and the the severity of, of the defect. Um, we we actually published that policy, chair. It's on our website, so yeah. I'd be happy to send a copy to the committee. And um, it, it's it's focused on our engineering staff, so it might be that a, a briefing would help. Yeah, uh, I, I'm interested in that because we've seen policy change before, and we're obviously working in a constrained budget position. Could we see that policy change going further down the track? So, you know, the the size of pothole lessens because we're in a situation where we don't have the funds to repair that? Or are, are we going to see another policy change? Well, clearly, it'll be for the minister to decide if, yeah. if that policy changes. And, and I, I know he, he recognises the value of, of proper road maintenance and improving the quality of the roads. And you've seen that in some of the allocations that he's made since he took up office. Um, you know, the the question really is one of resources. As I say, the reason this policy was introduced to to introduce a limited service was because there wasn't the money to deliver the full standard service. So, it would be possible to go out at the start of the financial year and repair everything, and then by about August we would run out of money. And when something bad happens, like a uh, you know, we could discover a void under the road, or there's a landslide, or there's a serious accident, or sig traffic signals fail. Then we would be in a position where we couldn't respond. So, mm -hmm. the the point of that is to lower the lower the intervention, or sorry, raise the intervention threshold, so that the money lasts for the full year. Given that how much of what we do is safety related, to to run out of money early in the year and not have cover, uh, to to do things that are important and urgent, w wouldn't be a position we would be very comfortable with. But clearly, that's that's part of. Um, the minister's decision on on how to prioritise within the resource constraints that the department has. There's a few more questions, just but you said that uh, obviously 184 capital, um, and in 2018 is that right? 2018, there was it was projected that 192 million was needed. Yeah. 2018 is quite a wee while ago. I'm sure those costs would be more today. So the, those are today's figures, so okay. the, the figure, there's a, a report produced, it's called the Barton Report, um, which the department published in 2018, and it used a figure of 143 million at 2018 prices. 
we know that that's 192 million at, at today's prices. So that's where those numbers came from. And then just going back to safety measures, I know a concern that always comes up and at the summertime, sight lines, grass cutting. Um, it may seem like a very small issue in the grand scheme of things, but it means a lot to people out there. Um, and whenever they see verges that are quite high, that are not getting cut, what what's projected for this summer and safety measures at site lines there for grass cutting? Well, we, we brought in a new environmental maintenance uh, policy last year, which, which was uh, around trying to balance the sort of the needs, the, the biodiversity that we require and, and the amount of grass cutting that we need to do in terms of road safety. So the, the, our current policy is that we will cut grass twice on, on all of our strategic and high traffic roads uh, and once everywhere else uh, where, we, where we can manage that. However, anywhere that has a road safety implication, such as sight lines, will be cut as often as required um, for, for road safety reasons. So, uh, and equally, we'll try and cut a minimum or we'll cut a swathe of grass, maybe at one or 1 1.2 metres wide if it's a, if it's a wide verge. Uh, and this is really around trying to sort of promote, promote a bit of biodiversity as well as maintain road safety. And then just lastly, one of my last questions before I go to members is around street lighting. Um, and we've seen reports in the past about street lights being turned off and, and one thing and another um, um, for cost saving and, and everything else. And I know in rural areas as well, a lot of people want to see street lights in their areas, but the policy might not match up to that. Can you just talk to some of the, the street lighting projects? I mean, you, you have went through a period of um, upgrading street lights as well. So could you just give us a, a brief on, on your street lighting policy? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I can take that one there. So in terms of street lighting, like say we have had a considerable period of investment in, over recent years to to upgrade many of our street lighting installations, particularly to make them more energy efficient, and um, we're mindful of, of the, the 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 energy costs and the resource costs that it's required to 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 light um, uh, that network. Um, so over the past number of years, there's been a, a considerable um, a considerable program to invest in upgrading those street lights to efficient LED. <laughs> Um, uh, fittings and that has has yielded considerable savings in terms of our, our overall energy costs. That program has maybe got about another year to run. Where where I think the, the uh, twenty four twenty five should should see that uh, the the vast majority of those um, of that program installed. Um, like I said, in parallel to that, we also have a a program of inspection and testing where we will look at the condition of our street lighting network and depending on what that inspection and testing comes along, inevitably some of our infrastructure does come to the end of its shelf life um, at certain stages. And you'd mentioned there about um, rural areas. Um, said that where, where installations do come to the end of their, their um, serviceable life and um, we have to make a decision as to whether we um, we replace those or not and like I say in in our current policy which again has been there for, for quite some time is that um, uh, in not all rural areas we will um, replace those particularly on some of the, the more um, uh, we will tend to light towards the the front door of people's houses. There's there's an issue around sort of back alleys and and, and things like that where um, we can no longer afford um, to light all those. Um, so, in in that context, whenever we do conclude those assessments of um, those assessments of, of inspection and testing, um, we will. Unfortunately, there are instances when we can no longer afford to replace. Um, installations in all locations, um, basically, and we will only do so where, where our current current policy allows us to do. That allows us to to ensure that our our finite finite resources uh, make sure that we 
deliver street lighting where they're most essentially needed. I just questions that have come up there regarding that. First of all, you say that the programme for street light upgrade will take another year. It's the, LED, the, the LED. LED refitting one. Okay. And the money is all secure there for that. Well, There'll be no further delays to that. Well, the budget for next year yeah, is a, the, the budget for twenty four twenty five is still to be set, and the yeah. executive will will decide that, and then the minister will make his choices around how to to allocate that budget across the department. <laughs> what we have done is we have ensured that we are ready to continue the program, <laughs> um, and on the assumption that money is there, that program can be delivered. And obviously, if money is not there, then it can't. Okay, and then the rural, the, the street lights, are you making more, are you finding an increase in the decisions of um, removing street lights from those particular areas with <coughs> the policy? And again, I'm, I'm thinking of within this budget position that we're in, you know, is that, are you weighing up budget or is it purely based upon at the moment, I'm not aware that the the policy level is the is the main sort of indicator for those. There, I'm not aware of any instances where we are replacing a street light installation and it meets policy to light, but we can't afford to put the installation in. That that's not we're, the, the we're case. We're not we're not taking out street lights to save money. Um, yeah. In that sense, at okay. all. No, we're just implementing the policy around what should be lit and should yeah. be lit at public expense and and is worth the environmental impact of the light and everything else. Um, we're not we're not at the point of, of going around the network looking for lights we could take out to save money. Okay. Um, having said that, you know, the electricity bill for the street lighting network is, is vast. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it would be sensible and we will plan to try and see are there ways in which we can reduce the need for that, whether that's through the continuation of the, the bulb replacement programme where we're cutting our energy needs by about 40% by replacing a sodium bulb with an LED bulb. Um, so there are things like that that we can do to try and bring that down and reduce some of the volatility that we've seen over the last few years in energy price and the impact that has had on our budget. Okay, I'll maybe move to, to members now. Cahill, you had indicated first. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. Um, you state there just in your document about the vacancies and the quits about 28%. Can you give us a bit of detail how, how we got to this point and, and how that... Clearly, that's a major impact on us in trying yeah. to deliver. Be fair to say, it's it's the biggest impact um, that that we that we are wrestling with at the minute. Um, it's a long and complicated story. I'll, I'll try and give you the short version. Um, colleagues will know that I could talk about this for longer than we have today. Um, reducing budget means we can't afford as many people. So, in the last couple of years, in particular, when the department's resource budget, which is how we pay for most of our salaries, has been so overcommitted. We can't make that worse by hiring more people and incurring a greater wage cost. Um, so that's one aspect. Another aspect would be um, a couple of decisions that were taken during the COVID pandemic, where quite rightly um, the system prioritised the filling of administrative vacancies to go to the Department of Health, the Department of the Economy and other organisations. And a lot of what we need from a DFI perspective are industrial and professional and technical posts. So the pause that came about in 2020 we're still feeling the effect of that because we would have ideally run competitions in 2020, 2021 that weren't run. So that created a bit of a gap as people continue to leave the organisation. We didn't have the same replacement. Um, and then the, the final aspect that, that we are experiencing, um, although we need to do some more work to, to figure out precisely how much impact it's having, is just the general difficulty um, in attracting and recruiting new staff in an environment where the pay rates that we are able to offer as, as a civil service department are not always in line with what people can earn, either in similar jobs in the private sector or in very different jobs in the private sector that they're equally able to apply for. So I think it's a combination of, of those things. No, and, and obviously it's clearly a knock-on effect because you know whatever vision we have for the future, besides doing the maintenance, whatever, whatever issues we have at the train, there, there's another part you talked about um, training programmes, graduate training programmes, and trying to incentivise or get people into the system. Can, do you want to expand a wee bit on that? Yeah. So. You know, civil service recruitment has a, has a has a format and a, a way it's done, um, and that works really well for a lot of a lot of roles. Again, thinking about who are we competing with for for new staff and how do they recruit and how are they um, bringing people into organisations? We recognise the need to 
really have a big focus on things like apprenticeships and graduate training programs um, and other innovative ways to bring people in. So we're exploring the use of the Assured Skills program, which is uh, a, a Department for the Economy program used for FDI companies um, and has been applied to the civil service in the last couple of years. And we're looking to see, can we deliver uh, a version of that that would help us with our particular recruitment needs to see if that model can still support professional, technical or industrial recruitment as well. I want to hear where I'm going through them as quickly as I can. <laughs> Sorry, I've loads, loads of questions and I let all the rest of them. I want, I want to just, um, the, the EVs, electric vehicles and, and the task force, I mean, can anybody comment on where we're at with it? I mean, we've made some progress in, in terms of charge points. Um, just want to see where that task force is at the minute because it's part of the decarbonisation and all of that and the targets. So. And we'd like to, yeah. Yeah, so certainly uh, the task force um, is something that we have been focusing on as part of the sort of wider transport decarbonisation plans. Um, you probably know from previously it involves, um, uh, it has obviously the departments ourselves, uh, Department for the Economy, has the utility regulator, private companies who run the charge point, um, uh, charge point operators there as well. Um, and the attempt in setting that up is to try and look at the things that are holding back the, the infrastructure it is run by the private sector. It is um, it's about how we enable that to roll out again commercially. Um, we've seen uh, a big increase in the number of EV charge points in the last year, um, and you know we see that set to continue. One of the things um, there's a there's a couple I think there's six actions in the in the plan that are around the the connection charges um, around how we look at um, the further rollout gaps um, and so yes very much looking to continue that but you know, as Colin said um, three days in terms of discussing some of these things with the Minister in terms of how we take them forward but I envisage that EV um, <coughs> remains a key issue in terms of transport decarbonisation. And just just two final wee points the the recent announcement of the 16 million that Minister O'Dowd talked about across the board in terms of what that can be spent on mm -hmm. and also just finally the uh, the number of claims in terms of damage, potholes and that. Can you comment on those two things, please? Thank you. The, the part of the allocation that, that came to this group was 9.1 million um, for structural maintenance and for potholes, and, and the Minister made written and oral statements on those in the Chamber. Um, so, uh, Colin, do you want to maybe talk about how we're going to use that? Yes, uh, there's, there's two elements of it that are going towards what we call structural maintenance, so um, uh, resurfacing and large-scale patching. So there, there's £1 million that we're going to use to target the, the roads that are in our worst condition. So areas that have deteriorated but maybe don't meet the intervention levels or that they're a bit of a patchwork in places. So we, we're, we're, we're looking to go into those areas where we have seen defect clusters and, and do large-scale patching. So that should allow us to deliver maybe between 40, 40 and 50 sort of, of those small scale schemes to just give that immediate improvement uh, in some of those worst hit areas. There, there's an additional 8.1 million then, which is, which is more significant, um, and that will go towards our uh, structural maintenance programs. That's our larger scale resurfacing scheme. So, um, and again, the, the teams within the local section offices are now developing up the programs, identifying those schemes that they can deliver um, quickly to, to to provide those overall resurfacing schemes to help help in the, again in the sort of the worst condition the, the areas of worst condition. Um, you'd asked about, yeah, about claims then. Um, so in twenty two twenty three we spent about eight million pounds um, on on claims arising out of, out of the road network, and we expect that in this year it'll be something similar. Um, that that's a higher figure than the historical trend. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of complicated reasons for that as, as well, um, and one of those, no doubt, is the deteriorating quality of the road network, which which leads to more accidents and more incidents that, that create liability. Um, however, we do look at every claim on its own merits, and uh, and we repudiate the ones that we don't accept the, the liability for. One of the big reasons for the increased cost of claims is how personal injury claims are valued by the courts. Um, and there was a change to that a number of years ago. And <coughs> typically, a personal injury claim is valued higher than it would have been, and that makes up, you know, that eight million will include a number of large, single settlements for significant personal injury claims that arise out of out of accidents. So, um, that's that's the the trend on that. Big so challenge for, for it us is, all. Um, and there, there's no doubt that there's better value for money if you fix the defect early, 
um, rather than even trying to fix it late, but certainly avoiding the possibility for someone to have an accident um, is always a, a better play for all sorts of reasons. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very Sorry, much. before I come to the Vice Chair, John, I just want to ask just a tiny question in relation to that 8.1 million. I thought it was interesting that the 8.1 million was announced and the claims were 1.8 million as well, or 8.1 million, I should say. I thought that was a funny little quirk. But um, how confident are you that that money will be able to be spent uh, by the end of the financial year? And can you just give an indication of that 8.1 million, how many, how much of that is going to each division? Yeah, um, certainly as soon, as soon as the Minister announced that the, the money would be made available, we immediately had that allocated out to each of the divisional areas. Now that is spread across each division. Um, based on the size of their road network and, and the overall need and their capability and capacity to be able to deliver schemes. Uh, as I say, those, the, the teams in those areas are all working very hard uh, at the moment to, to put together programmes um, to be able to deliver that. And we will start to see those schemes going on on the ground very, very soon. Um, but it, it, it is certainly very challenging to spend it between now and the end of the financial year, but we do absolutely everything we can to ensure that it is. Do you have a breakdown for each indiv individual area in terms of money? I can provide that yeah. to you, Chair, separately. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. <coughs> Sorry, Vice okay. Chair. No, <laughs> in you come. Um, folks, thanks so much for coming along today and for taking the time. Um, I, I don't envy often the task that you have as a department to do. The work is, is just through the roof. And it's the one, probably the, the one main department that everybody sees every day because everybody uses the assets that you are there to maintain. And I can speak from my constituency office and probably for everyone else's that it, it's the Department of Infrastructure remit is the one that comes to my office the most in terms of people's queries and complaints. And we have to deal with those. And on that point, I want to put on record my thanks to your staff in the Northern Division, in Carrick, Ferguson and Lauren, who go above and beyond often the Call of Duty. And even when they can't resolve the many pressures I put on them on behalf of constituents, they do it in a in a fair manner and try to manage expectations as best as possible. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of points, some some have already been addressed, but I just want to dive into the £192 million. I think what you said, Colm, was that that's what you need to provide the, perf the ideal service effectively. And as a result of reduced, reduced funding in that, you're on to a limited service. Within that, is there a tiered limited service in terms of how that would look if we got you to 170, yeah. 180 million? And get, what I want to do is tease out where it gets to when the threshold, for example, of assessing potholes or street lights starts to <coughs> go up and down in terms of that assessment criteria. I'll maybe attempt to answer that. <laughs> you, can, you can come in as well. Um, so the, the, the where you set the threshold is related to the scale of the asset. Yeah. And the duty that we have is to maintain it all. Okay. So when you look at the roads order 1993, and it talks about the department's duty to maintain the road. It does say with regard to traffic volumes and, and other types of things, but, but there isn't a waiver for any part of it. Mm -hmm. So when we think about where that threshold gets to be set, um, we do it in, con in sort of full awareness that we have to be able to apply that equally and consistently to the best of our ability. Um, and that starts to make it harder to do incremental changes. You either need to take something all out or leave it all in. It, it's harder to justify um, a, a more variated uh, picture. But what we can do is we can always we can always use additional money. Mm -hmm. So we would we're we're sort of ready and able to to take money and spend it as as you've seen even late in the financial year. It doesn't quite extend to being able to change the formal policy, not least because. The courts will look to see what are the department's published formal policies and has it actually adhered to them. So we need to be sure that we can do that consistently where everybody might encounter a defect that the policy says should be should be addressed if possible or, or if the resources are available. It gets harder, it gets a, a bit messier. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think it is it is quite complicated in, in the way that the breakdown of the essential maintenance budget is set. So there are elements of it that are are very much sort of inescapable, you know. For for example, traffic signals. So there's a there's a, a bulk of money there that that can change. The, the lights are either maintained and they stay on, or they or they they have to be switched off. So, so when you when you have elements of it already set, um, small changes to the remainder of the budget don't make that much change to us on the ground. You know, we 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 have done what we can with the budget, which is why we've we've had to reduce to the the limited service uh, across the network, but. Um, it would take it would take a 
you know, additional money, we would estimate between 55 and 60 million to take us to uh, a normal level of, of service. Or so when, you, when you look at, so we, we fund the large scale stuff through the capital budget, and we fund the, the day to day safety maintenance through the resource budget. And we've done a bit of work on trying to analyse the difference between that, that number that, t- that keeps the network in the right condition uh, and what, what we've actually got. Um, you know, depending on how far you want to go back and what period you want to analyse, we're, we're talking about close to a billion pounds less over about 10 years um, than, than what we know the sensible amount of money takes to maintain an asset. And you know, the analogy we often use is you know, if you have a car or a house, and you know rightly you can get away without maintaining it properly for a year or two and not really suffer too badly but if you do that for 10 years you're going to have a problem and it's going to cost you more to fix and so on and that applies as equally to the road network as it does to all those other types of assets yeah i totally agree i think there's been long-term underinvestment on a roads network and i think he's like what you're saying this is going to get worse before it gets better in terms of that asset is gradually going to be underinvested year after year. So we're going to see more potholes in the road and we're going to be almost running to stand still to repair those effectively with the budget that we're currently on. So I, I don't think we're in a position where we are slowing the decline, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. We're, we're doing everything that can be done yes. uh, and we're working incredibly hard to keep the network functional yeah. and to ensure that it fulfills the purpose that we all rely on it for. Um, you know, it's, it's laws of physics, yes. water and temperature and interaction of materials will continue to happen until such times as we can fix things. Yeah. Um, and everybody knows that you know, a small pothole becomes a big pothole, <coughs> even if you do nothing, um, or especially if you do nothing, um, yeah. and that, that's where we are. <coughs> okay, um, leads me on to two other points. From a financial p- planning point of view, how do you assess when a scheme gets completely resurfaced versus patchwork after patchwork after patchwork? I can think of one street in my town, Cary Fergus, that has the same pothole has appeared 10 times in the last year, and do you know how much it's cost in compensation? And people, it's like there that often people don't think it's ever been filled in. Um, when does the factor in a financial planning look at saying, right, let's do this properly rather than stick, put a sticking plaster on it in the interest of saving money? Yeah, well, uh, the, our local section office who design the resurfacing programmes, they, they apply a, f- a full set of criteria to, to all schemes that they, they are developing and put into the programme. Uh, now this is very much based on the number of defects on that stretch of road, the, the number of claims that they've had, the, the amount of traffic, the, the classification of the road, a number of other things including you know, the, the number of complaints they would get about a particular road. Um, and that is all taken into account along with um, other, other condition survey information that we do. So we, we also survey the network for its, instruct- or its structural integrity. Um, it's, it's surface coarseness all, there's a whole range of other sort of data points and factors that are taken into account. Uh, so that builds up a picture um, and allows them to, to build up a prioritised programme of schemes which they can then use when money is allocated to them to, to, to deliver those schemes. So whilst they accept yes some areas you know, we will look like they could do with, with work, there will always be, be others. And, you know, on, on the list that are of a higher priority, and we just have to make the the, the budget go as far as we can. And if we look at if we look at that position for this year, the twenty three twenty four year, we've got the hundred ninety two figure for for capital restructuring that that would be needed. We got ninety at the start of the year, and the minister has been able to increase that to ninety nine, mm-hmm. which is great. But we're still quite a bit short of one hundred ninety two. So there is always a higher priority scheme is, is, is one of the things that we would find, you know, when you think about how big the network is, mm-hmm. it's 26,000 kilometres, it's, it's, it's vast. Um, the number of schemes that we would like to do from a purely engineering perspective, so far out, see, out, outweighs or exceeds the budget that's available, that yes, there will be schemes that need done, that we would agree need done. Um, but we're just not able to prioritise them, and that's that's how people would experience just how you, just what you've been talking about. One more from my chair, is that okay? Um, in terms of uh, the winter service, I mean, we've been pretty lucky over the last few years that it's been days rather than weeks that we're measuring really cold weather in, and to that end it hasn't really impacted the winter service too much. What concerns do you have going forward about the budget for winter service, whether that be gridding, and then the impact should that get worse on our roads without the additional investment we need? The department has always prioritised winter service precisely because, yeah, you know, un- unlike a pothole or a, or a bad patch of road where you would experience that problem over a longer time, you'll experience gridding at half seven the next morning if gridding isn't there. Um, and we saw a little bit of that in January when we mm-hmm. had the concurrent weather emergencies and the industrial action. 
Um, so we have always prioritised gritting. It's equally not been in our baseline. Yeah. So the department has bid at monitoring rounds every year for the money it needs to grit the roads, and and has got it to be you know to be fair that that strategy has worked. Um, it'd be better if it was baselined, but there are lots of pressures on on budgets across the whole system, and and ministers and the executive will will decide that. Um, certainly, if we got to a point where we felt unable to deliver gritting, we would treat that as a really high priority, uh, and we would be unlikely to just sit and say, "Oh well, you know, there we are, no money." It, it would be something we would have to try and prioritise ahead of other things. Um, so, okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, please. Thanks, Chair. Thank, thank you, um, Stephen. Hey, thank you, Chair. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, folks, for coming along with your very detailed discussion and presentation. Just a couple of points to pick up on. Um, I know the staffing was mentioned. Um, earlier, just around the, the recruitment challenges, and I'm, I'm aware of that locally within my own area from you know regular contact with your your staff and so on. And I suppose it, it's um, would you acknowledge that that's you've seen a change from years ago when uh, the public sector post like that was, was was obviously very attractive. And I suppose it's interesting that competitive private sector obviously you're facing you know a lot of competition for getting technical. Expertise is that that's obviously your experience. Would it be? Yes, say? it would. Um, we're we're doing some work on benchmarking pay yeah. rates across some of the specialist disciplines, um, to try and inform what exactly we sh we should do about that and how we should engage with the Department of Finance in particular on that. But all of us could could give you anecdotal examples of colleagues who have left the department to work in the private sector in particular, and even sometimes to our own arm's length bodies for more pay than we are able to offer them and within yeah. the civil service pay structure. Getting those you know, engineers starting out their career as well, obviously, is a big challenge, isn't it? But I think the apprenticeship approach is you know, very positive and seeing a department taking the lead on it, you know, um, putting, you know, going up for priority is important. So hopefully that'll be something can be built upon. Just a couple other comments in terms of roads maintenance. As has been mentioned, is you know, the number one issue coming through all of our offices. and. My own constituency in North Down is no different. Just in terms of the criteria for um, investment investment in their roads maintenance, is it correct that, that the criteria isn't based on population traffic volume, but it's actually based on the length of roads? Is that the case? No, the, the overall maintenance policy um, is, is based on the, the volume of traffic on roads, so that, that the highest traffic roads will, will result. Um, priority when it comes to defect repair. Equally for um, the resurfacing program, the volume of traffic on the road network as well is is one of the criteria that we use. Yeah, no, that's okay. Just in, in terms of leading on from that, then obviously on the uh, the league tables, people like to be top of league tables, but not in this case. With Orange and North Down, was um, <coughs> over three thousand eight hundred potholes were reported. And I appreciate that was reported. You know, and those could be. I understand that we reported 10 times the same pothole and that goes down as 10, but it is obviously a, a leg table which we don't want to be to be leading on. Um, but yet, Ards North Down Council area w was, was one of the least funded for roads maintenance. Now, I appreciate um, the recent fund announcements from the Minister and so on will hopefully address that. But um, just to go back, you know, and I think we very much are in a pothole crisis out there. And as I said, it is the, the number one issue. People are very, very frustrated out there with the, the condition of our roads and even sometimes the temporary nature of repairs. I've seen one very close to my office in Bangor where they were uh, repaired um, manually and within, within a week it was reopened again. You know, so there are real issues around that. But I think I would also like just to... Uh, pay tribute to, to the, the section office in Orange <coughs> North Down, particular Stephen Gardner, the section engineer who has come in relatively recently to our area and is certainly you know do, doing a good job doing his best in what are challenging circumstances. So, just finally, in terms of the, the that intervention level, the twenty mil and the fifty millimeter thing, you know, how realistic do you think w could we get back to the, the the twenty mil intervention? Do you think? Again, it, it, it comes down to the, the budget that's yeah. available to be able to do it. The, the, the intervention level set as it is now, um, um, due to the limited resource budget that it's available to us, as said, yeah. you know, the, the, our essential maintenance service is funded to 35 million at the moment. That gives us the limited service, mm -hmm. uh, but we would estimate 55 to 60 mm -hmm. million would take us to to what we had previously, our pre, our our service before. 
if I could maybe just pick up on the point around temporary yeah. repairs as well, just to explain. Um, when when we pick up a defect, it it is categorised and has to have a time to have it fixed. Yeah. You know, in terms of us meeting our statutory obligations around keeping the road network safe. Sometimes that's twenty four hours. Sometimes it's five yeah. days. Sometimes we get we get a month to fix them, just depending on where it is and the severity yeah. of it. Uh, which means because because of that time restriction and the need to make it safe, we will sometimes do um, a temporary repair. Yeah. And and that is sometimes what people might see that it, that it's not a permanent repair. And yes, they can fail because they are only there until such times as we can get back to do a permanent yeah. repair. It's not it's not the ideal situation for us either. And ideally, we would like to do a permanent repair first time every time, um, but we simply don't have the resources to, yeah. be able to do. Yeah, no, and appreciate that. And we've seen that in a two dual carriageway, for example, Bangor to Belfast, forty thousand vehicle movements. You know, and when things have come up urgently, your folks are straight on to it, given the you know the severity and the risks associated with it. Just a couple of final points. You know, it has been a relatively mild winter, and always the frost was always put down as a a big issue for potholes. But I think that the heavy rainfall seems to be nearly worse, certainly in, in North Town. That seems to is that something that you've seen across the country? Yes, without doubt. Any any form of severe weather at all will will cause a, a marked deterioration in the network and it's usually at this time of year that we do see that. Um, yes, frost and ice will will damage um, the road surfaces but equally so will so will heavy rain yeah. where it's able to get in and wash away underneath and then undermine the sort of the integrity yeah. of the road network. Well there's just final point Chair if I may please just was uh, in terms of weed spraying. I know it comes up every year and speaking to the, the, the section engineers they are keen to get going at it early obviously with contract codes that we all see out in the, in the spring and is that very much a priority for, for this year? Yes, we, we currently do intend to carry out a full a full weed spraying um, operation in, in the coming year. Again, uh, the the way the weed spraying has to work, it, the, the weeds almost have to start to come up before we can start the spraying applications because there needs to be something for the um, for the weed the weed killer to get into to destroy the weeds. Um, but that the, the intention is um, subject to the budgets to, to carry out a full a full weed spraying operation yeah. this year. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. We'll not even touch about the rain in Fermanagh South your own. But uh, Mark the floods in your area. <laughs> Mark, uh, just <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the team for coming along. I'd start by echoing uh, other members' appreciation of the work that uh, you and your colleagues do uh, it must be it's obviously uh, very difficult the circumstances are very uh, strained but I think it's fair to say our road network is the most visible symptom of the stripping of public services that we've seen uh, for more than a decade now it's reflected in the volume of complaints and calls that we get and the volume of complaints and calls that you get uh, in turn uh, from us uh, Many of the points ha have been touched on. In, in terms of the A5, we obviously are delighted and, and, and welcome the announcement from the Dublin government. Uh, last week, there's, there are still, I'm sure, hurdles to jump and hoops to go through. Obviously, there's a desire to get on the ground in this uh, calendar year, but there's many a, a slip, twixt cup and lip, and we've probably been here uh, before. I was just wondering, in the interim, is there the capacity or intention to front load any of, of, of that work, or is there stuff that can be done along the route in terms of prioritising particular accident black spots or more dangerous areas outside of the, the main scheme itself? Yeah. So, obviously, the Minister has made his position on the A5 really clear and he has made that really clear to us as officials as well and so that's that's the focus for our work and you're right there there's a lot of challenges potentially ahead when you're delivering something as large and complex as 85 kilometers of new dual carriageway and um, the existing a5 road has has not been forgotten about we've delivered a range of safety improvements to that road over the last number of years and we continue to look for safety issues that could be effectively addressed and i suppose the the extent to which that's that's a, 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 a strong option, is reflected in the fact that, that we've proposed an 85 kilometre dual carriageway offline road as the main safety intervention available and, and, the, and the optimal safety intervention available. While there would be other things that could in theory be done, the, they wouldn't have the same benefit to safety as, as the scheme would. Um, 
but that is something that we're continuing to look at and certainly um, I know that the staff and the section offices in Western Division continue to look at the A5 road, the existing road, to see are there schemes there that could be addressed and there are a couple of things I think we're looking to um, improve a, a junction in OMA this year as, as part of the plan. Again, members will be aware that we, we publish an annual report to each council and the, the council reports for the councils that, that encompass the A5 have a number of schemes in there aimed specifically at um, improving the, the existing road as well. I say five after I A6, you won't be surprised uh, to, 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 to hear Colin uh, that there's been great work done on it but we're not there yet. Uh, mm. I was wondering is the completion of A6 anywhere uh, on the radar or, or, or how w w we can move that up the agenda potentially? Uh, like I say, great work has been done but there's the creation of a huge bottleneck at Drumahoe, it's, it's, it's worse than Dungiven ever was, <laughs> actually, and the associated issues that causes, not just for motorists, but obviously for residents and the environment too. So, so last year, in the absence of ministers, the department published a prioritisation of major road schemes, um, and the A6 was one of the schemes that we identified that would continue to be developed, so so we are continuing to develop. It's obviously, and it's, it was an executive flagship scheme as well, and we're conscious of that. Um, You'll be familiar that the route for the final section goes near the Moboy Waste site. So at the minute we're we're working with DARA and we're part of the working group that's looking at that. And once we understand the plans for remediating that site, um, which we would need before we could finalise proposals for the minister's consideration on on that road, we would be we'd be able to do that once we see what that's going to look like. Obviously, we're we're building alongside the River Fawn. We're going to build a bridge over it. Um, it's all. It's a complex ecosystem. We don't want to. We don't want to do anything that would make anything worse, or that would interfere with the ability to remediate the site. Um, so I suspect we will wait for that. Um, obviously, mm. subject to the minister's consideration. No, I fear that could uh, take a, wh a while. Sadly, I just wonder might there be potential in the future to look at the decoupling of of Caw, Maidown, and uh, Maidown Drumahoe potentially to, to, to sort of skip. The Maboy site uh, until that's sorted. E everyone's mentioned that the, the state of the roads, and we do welcome the recent um, ministerial statements and additional uh, investment. You've touched on how much of a, a difference that will make, and it, it will more than scratch the surface, but but just a, a, a about more. People have talked about the maintenance methodology, if you like, pr with particular focus on the possible repairs, but I think a similar. Logic could be applied to, and I think we've I've mentioned that to you before, Colin, the, the the gullies, and the reduction in the number of times in, in the good old days. We didn't know they were good when we were in them, but the gullies were getting cleared four times a year. Then it was reduced to two. Now it's one, but it, but it's it's not even one because if the lorry comes along and there's a car parked over, they they just batter on and. They won't be back till next year, yeah. and and obviously we've seen an increase in flooding events across various constituencies, and this all does play a, a, a part in it. I, I, I wonder if there are any plans to re review just how these things are done. Yeah, so I mean, it is something we're co we're conscious of, and when we see heavy rainfall and we see flooding, we we recognise that road drainage has a part to play, and and preventative maintenance is better than reactive maintenance, um. We've talked a little bit about financial constraints, which are relevant, but equally on, particularly on on something like gully emptying, the the staffing constraints that we have in the number of vacancies in our industrial workforce, where we don't have the bodies to go around and have multiple crews doing gully emptying at the same time, um, we we have to deploy our people resources as carefully as we do our financial ones. So that that's relevant there, but certainly we recognise the impact that it can have. Um, and we do we do discuss it regularly, and we're we're considering what we might do, um, but always in the understand that, that there isn't any additional money at this point in time, and until there is, it's going to be difficult to to do much more than than the current policy states. Yeah, and, and with this uh, additional investment, and, and and we've asked for a breakdown of how that's spent, spent, that that will be welcome. But I'd also be interested to see the, the formula that's applied, you know, because it seemed to be a, a cocktail there of need of. The, the traffic volume of, of roads and then of capacity to deliver the schemes in time, which would concern me because sometimes maybe where the great the need is greatest, that's a reflection of a lack of capacity. They have been addressing stuff as we've gone along and you wouldn't want to perpetuate that 
in, in, in the any way? No, I mean, when, when we're talking about capacity there, I think we're mostly talking about contractor capacity to deliver. So obviously we employ contractors to deliver large-scale schemes and our staff do the design, some of the design work and the supervision and so on, but we're not actually doing, doing the work. So that's where that becomes more of an issue at short notice, depending on what our contractors have programmed. It's one of the reasons why a multi-year budget would allow us to be to be in a position to deliver better value even with with the same sort of numbers because you can program carefully and you can work with our delivery partners and our suppliers to, to program that effectively and, and do, do you know where you liberty say where exactly this money has come from is this money that you were saving maybe for literally a, a rainy day that it hasn't arrived yet this uh, financial year i know in response to the winter services question he says how every year you'd be successful in monitoring rounds, sadly, for five out of the last seven years, we haven't had any monitoring rounds, and I know how dependent the department has been on them. So, therefore, there has surely been a huge negative cumulative impact of lack of government for five years out of the last seven. Certainly, the absence of monitoring rounds makes it impossible to bid for, for money in year uh, and, and has an impact. Um, the money that was reallocated at the, in the current year on the capital side came from a mixture of some schemes not progressing as fast as, as we had hoped and therefore needing less money this year uh, and a number of sort of uh, uh, the allocations of our, our the technical accounting for, for whether something was resource or capital or so on. Um, winter services resource budget, it's primarily the cost of labour. Um, so there are some supply material costs for salt and there's vehicle maintenance and so on, but the drivers are, are a large part of the cost, the drivers, the, the supervisors, the scouts and so on that populate that out of ours rota. So it has come from the resource budget, which is one of the reasons why the absence of monitoring rounds there was particularly difficult, because the resource budget is under even more pressure than the capital budget. And finally, Chair, I promise, uh, <laughs> finally. you haven't got your budget yet uh, for next year, and budgets are always a challenge and are becoming more of a challenge every year. Under the new Climate Act, uh, it could become potentially more challenging given the compulsion that that puts on yourselves to spend 10% of the roads budget on active travel schemes. Have you worked out yet how you actually are, are, are going to do that? I mean, we welcome investment in active travel and it attempts to tackle the climate crisis, but, but how much of a challenge will that present for the department? I think it will undoubtedly present a big challenge, so there, there's a number of different challenges. Um, Ten percent of the transport budget includes public transport, roads, th the whole lot. Um, those are budgets that are already under significant pressure. Um, if you think about what we have spent on active travel over the last number of years, you're talking around 12 or 13 million pounds a year. You could be talking multiples of that to deliver 10 percent um, of the transport budget that, that DFI spends. and. And it is not easy to readily identify where you would take that money from in the context of a flatlined budget uh, rolled forward. So that will obviously be for the Minister to decide his priorities and the budget allocations. Uh, what we have been focusing on over the last year in particular is having the capacity to grow our ability to spend sensibly and in a value for money way so that we can deliver that 10 per cent target. I mean, we, we take it very seriously. It's, it's literally the law. and. There you are. So, how are we going to respond to that? Has been the challenge we've set ourselves. You know, an organisation that can spend twelve million pounds a year in one year can't spend seventy million pounds the next year. We need to have a plan to grow our ability to deliver, uh, and we've got a lot of work underway that we're hoping to engage with the minister on over the next number of weeks and months to to set that out and allow him to to take some choices on how he'd like us to proceed. Okay. Hey, uh, Danny. Oh, thank you, Chair. And you, thank you for your presentation and answers. You'll be glad to know that I won't have three or four final, final questions. I only have a couple. <laughs> I don't even want final. It was. Um, it took me a while. You actually there, just a little blow the whistle on him. But Colin actually touched on it when you were answering, Mark. Actually, it was just look, the challenges over the last number of years have really come to fore with the, the budgetary constraints and, and austerity that we've experienced over the last fourteen years. Um, staff challenges. Well, one we have experienced as, as as members and as in our constituencies that sometimes projects and schemes are held up because of contractual issues. I'm just wondering is that is that pressure eased? Um, uh, I'm going to jinx myself if I answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I worry, but um, so we we've done a lot of work on our procurement over the last number of years, and and you know everybody's aware of the challenges the departments had mm -hmm. over a five to ten year period, particularly around procurement challenge. 
Um, so we revised our procurement strategy for, for our roads procurement um, and we've introduced term contracts for things like asphalt resurfacing uh, and we have progressed the, the procurement of things that we need in, in a different way. So in a number of cases we've created framework options for contracts that give a little bit more flexibility and can ensure that the capacity can be there uh, when we need it because we recognise the, the damage that was done in years where we didn't have resurfacing contracts, we couldn't deliver large schemes and we know that that wasn't um, that wasn't optimal by any means, so um, we have improved that position. Um, we procure things all the time. Uh, any anyone who doesn't get a contract has the right to challenge, um, and you can never be sure exactly on what ground someone might seek to challenge. But recognising the complexity of it, we we put a lot of effort into trying to do it as as robustly as we can in a way that's compliant with the law and fair to all the bidders and so on. Um, and and hopefully that will continue to be the case. And, and just quickly, because it's been touched on already, and it's around, it's really around climate change and decarbonisation. I uh, know the minister in his, in his statement had mentioned within the 16 million around the fleet of, of TransLink to moving towards zero emissions. Just wondering any any sort of we updating where that's sitting at, at the moment. Um, so TransLink actually doesn't sit within our group. Yeah. So I, I probably uh, invite my colleagues next week to, to talk about that. No problem. We have a similar challenge on on the roads fleet. Um, we operate a lot of a lot of vehicles ourselves, typically not cars and vans that can most easily be switched to electric. So we're having to look at other potential alternative fuels like hydrogen and so on. Um, again, the resource constraint can be a, a real limiting factor there. Um, a vehicle that maybe costs £120,000 <coughs> could cost 470 for the, the decarbonised version, yeah. and we don't have that. Uh, and that's part of the challenge and part of that balancing act that we need to do. Yeah, no, thank you. Super. Um, Keith. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming along. Um, and just as I said, thank you to the people on the ground that actually work with us day and daily to solve our problems. I have several questions, and I'm going to go rattle through them fairly quickly. Um, grass cutting. You referred about grass cutting, and twice in A roads, for example, or higher volume roads, possibly one. Uh, whenever you set a contract to a contractor to cut that grass, and whether it's a C road going on to a B or a B to an A. Does that contract have to cut more than the, the, the width of the cut, which is the one metre, and is that into his or her contract? Well, generally, I'd say we we will instruct the contractors to to cut one full swathe mm -hmm. everywhere except sight lines. So generally, we we will only be expecting to to see that that one or one and a half metre cut along all of our verges, other than at sight lines where the whole the whole verge may need to be cut just for. And, and do they do that, and is that into the contract, or are you, are, are you expecting them to do it, or do they know to do it? Because I don't always see that. Yes, you go to it from a B road onto an A road, and you have a massive sight line whenever the road is built. But you've effectively that height of grass on a one metre strip, so your nose, if your car is, is out on the road, before you actually can see. So are they supposed to cut wider than the one pint metre at the sight line? Yes, certainly. And anywhere that there is a sight line, that the grass should be cut. And who places that? Well, that will be our section offices again, um, who instruct and, and look after those contracts. Now, it, grass cutting is done through a combination of our own internal contractor and our external contractor, so it is, it is both. But, but again, um, you know there are difficulties with resources that have been mentioned before, and, and the staff on the ground are, are very very busy, and you know, we certainly don't get round to check check the the work that's done as often as we would like to. Um, lighting then referred to obviously lighting. See the savings you're making from an LED uh, retrofit from obviously sodium or whatever you're changing to. Where does that saving go to? Does that stay within the lighting budget, or does it stay when goods go back into the resource budget? Um, it's managed at a departmental level, so. Typically, we're saving about forty percent of the electricity cost when we when we switch from a sodium bulb to an LED bulb, and um, that that just reduces the amount that we need to be allocated to deliver the same service. So we don't we don't get that money and keep it. Um. Uh, weed spray on them, um, and I don't mean this rude, but sometimes it's weed feeding instead of weed spraying. Who tells the contractor what product to use? Is that is that a direction from you? Or is that a direction from the, the contractor to spray the weeds? Because sometimes they spray them and nothing happens. Well, certainly the, the types of materials they use are set out within the specifications. We don't, we don't state actual products, but we tell them that the range of, of, of types of chemicals that they're allowed to use, these are set in conjunction with whatever codes of practice there are around environmental maintenance. Um, and then it's up to the contractor at that stage to go and source the correct, the correct product to be able to go and treat the weeds then. And again, who places that c contract? Because I see the, the, the little quad bikes out spraying, and you come back, and normally two weeks, weed should be gone. And I appreciate you can't have rain and can affect it, 
but it's not effective. Yeah. You know, and, and in around the States specifically, it's, it's just, you know, these weeds literally grow on that high and they'll say to me these weren't spread, but they were spread, so you're really feeding them. So there's an issue with the product or the application of the product. Yeah, well certainly it can be a combination of that or as you yeah. say, the, the weather can can make them less effective, but it's really up, it's up to our contractors to then go back and retreat those and to ensure that we maintain a weed-free environment. We supplemented. There are restrictions on the, <laughs> on the product on the product that can be used to the environmental and health yeah. concerns. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. But it's just the point. You know, you're doing the application of the product, but it's not doing the not doing the job. Um, we talked about new roads. Um, the A6, the A5, Macarthur bypass, and a scaling bypass, possibly Cookstown bypass. Um, we're building all new roads, but we're not maintaining what we have. So, what's your personal opinion on that, with respect to? And yes. You could build the A6 and up into, uh, and I travelled most days to Castle Dawson, it's great, but in a period of time that's going to be maintained, but the road structure feeding into that is in bits. So how are we going to get our resource and our capital correct? And yes, we need new roads to a degree. So what's your thoughts on that? Because we're not maintaining what we have. Yeah. Um, you'll forgive me if I point out I don't have a personal opinion, I'll have my, my <laughs> minister's opinion in due course. You can tell me later. Um, uh, so good answer, Colin. That's a the good start. Yeah. That's a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Look, <clears throat> balance of maintaining what we've got, building new roads, it, it is an excellent question. It, it can only be answered almost at a societal level. I think there's a, there's a question for the department through the minister and the executive and everyone else around the relative priority of all sorts of things across government. Um, road maintenance is at the heart of every aspect of day-to-day -day life. We all use it. None of us can leave the house without thinking about work because the second you, you cross your driveway or your front door, you're onto the network that we're in charge of and responsible for. Um, so I think there is a, there's a legitimate debate to be had on that. Um, when you look at the need to ensure that we have a network that provides the same kind of connectivity to communities all across um, Northern Ireland, uh, particularly looking at regional balance. And so you, you've seen over recent years a number of schemes designed to improve regional connectivity on the strategic network in particular. We can all see the value in that. We can equally all see the value in maintaining all of the existing roads to a higher standard. If you were to ask us from an engineering perspective, we should do all, we should do all of that. Um, that that would be that would be the closest we would have to an opinion in terms of the relative priority of, for budgets. Um, I'll respectfully leave that to, to others. Yeah, and then last question, Chair. It'll cover the public liability claims, about the 8.1 million. If you were to take that 8.1 million and break that down for me into let's call it potholes, purely potholes, on a damaged vehicle. How do you analyse that figure year on year based on what you're paying at the resource to repair the roads? And an, an answer, if you can explain to me, so if, if you uh, inspect a road, for example, the 1st of January, that's your inspection day, I come along two weeks later and there's a pothole that's appeared and I damage my vehicle, where does the clock start to tick? So you do the, the, the test or the check on the 1st of January, a vehicle's damaged in a few weeks with no yellow paint. Explain to me, if you're explaining to the motorist out there, how that process works. So. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I suppose just to, to put it in the world context, the, in, in the last financial year we had about three and a half thousand claims on the road network. This year to date we've had almost four thousand. We're, we're receiving about 200 claims a week. What, what, what percentage then do you pay? Well, it, it varies. I'd say I wouldn't have the, the exact mm. figures in front of me. Like I say, we, we, do, we do have a statutory defence where we, where we are maintaining the road network and we will certainly investigate all claims um, to ensure that we have you know, carried out our obligations. Um, uh, the roads order requires us to maintain the, the road network in a reasonable condition. So therefore, you know, and that comes through our inspection <coughs> regime and then the the speed at which we repair the road depending on the, the volumes of traffic and, this, and where the road is. Uh, from from whenever we, we pick up the defect, um, we will have a certain amount of time to fix that defect. However, if if there was damage to a vehicle or anything was to happen in, in the interim, then we would certainly defend that in terms of, well, we are carrying out our reasonable um, maintenance regime. We, we can't be everywhere and we can't fix everything all at the one time. Um, however, there will be cases where you know, we maybe haven't fixed the defect within the required time period, or we haven't we haven't picked the defect up. Um, and in those cases, there may be a legitimate claim for compensation. Ultimately, we would invite the court to decide whether 
we have successfully discharged our duty to maintain the road or not and obviously if the court determines that we haven't in a particular case uh, and, and determines that the department's liable that's that's where a claim would be paid out see a, a last one here abandonment <laughs> uh, on, ab on abandonment do you get any income from abandonment so f will it be a contractor look on a piece of property and appreciate you don't always own the bed and soil so if, generally if we own the underlying ground it would be disposed of As in through, through, the process. through the normal government disposal of land process um, no we, we don't ever abandon for direct exchange of money or anything like that um, we generally only abandon when we're satisfied that the road is no longer needed so, for traffic. So if there's a road and let's say I, I own the bed and rock below it and you had the road and you abandon that where does liability lie then? It's the landowner. Because uh, you've abandoned it at that point legally? Legally that means we're no longer under an Ma obligation to, to maintain, maintain it. it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I wasn't lying when I said that everybody's very keen to ask questions today. Um, Peter, yep. you're next. Thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, by virtue of coming towards the end of the question session, a number of my questions have already been answered. Um, I think Cahill was the person I was eyeing up there for stealing all the good ones from me. Um, so my, I, I don't have, apologize, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> record so that, I, record that. I have, I have about four questions just, but they're all quite you know, scatter gun, so um, I'll take them one by one. Can I get an update on the Eastern Transport Plan in the context of a climate emergency and the need to move to multimodal travel? And I suppose at this stage, can I put on record my thanks to Tony Rafferty uh, for taking me on a tour um, over the summer there and telling me all about how exciting the plan is. I think I saw during those briefings that um, uh, Mark and I had received, and Cal as well, that's a really exciting project um, that's going to be delivered. So can we get an update on where that's at at the minute? Yes, so they've become known as Tony Tours, um, <laughs> and certainly if anyone else is interested, I'm sure I'll sign them up for further tours. Um, where are we in terms of, um, you'll know that there was a public consultation in terms of the objectives and uh, the vision. We had a staggering number of responses, and at the minute we're still going through those. Um, so, um, and we hope to bring it to the Minister for further discussion. Obviously, we haven't had a chance to talk to him about it. He has not been out on a tour yet, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so like, that's something we're, we're very keen to... Um, Talk to him about. Have they gone to Belfast City Council yet? The council has been involved throughout the whole throughout process, it, yeah. so um, like, to all the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the other councils, it's not. It's obviously not just Belfast. And can I get an update on the DFI policy in regards to introducing 20 miles an hour zones in residential areas? I know it was trialled at a number of schools, and I'm just wondering, is there any thoughts about introducing those in some residential areas? Um, so. Consideration of things like speed limit changes would be part of that decarbonisation plan. So, in the context of having to produce proposals and policies to deliver net zero in transport, that might be one of the things that we would look at. Um, we're, we're still working through exactly what the the climate action plan needs to have in it, and obviously supporting the Department for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs on on their lead on that. Um, but speed limit changes might be part of that. Ultimately, it would be for the Minister to decide the blend of policies that, that he wishes to take forward. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that we have a very good understanding of the impact that, that interventions across the board would have on carbon emissions in particular. Um, thirdly, this is something that comes from a conversation with someone uh, very recently. Have you any plans to introduce more average speed camera systems to improve road safety? Um, I never really knew the distinction uh, in terms of the fixed speed cameras and the average speed cameras. And average sounded like a really good idea to me as someone who would drive quite early in the morning to go to the gym and you know the Newton Arms Road turns into a motorway. I think at that stage, you know, car, I, I, I've seen cars driving quite slowly before the fixed speed camera and they speed right up again. Um, so is, is average speed cameras something that you've maybe looked into? Speed enforcement is both very popular and very unpopular at exactly the same time. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <No>. Absolutely. <laughs> we don't have any current work looking specifically at that, but we do look at speed in the context of safety. And so when we're looking at the safety of a junction or of a stretch of road, the speed limit is part of the consideration that we would give to that. So that is happening regularly across the network and a number of specific locations where speed studies are being conducted still. Um, but not necessarily at this stage at a, at a network-wide level. Okay. And, and then lastly, I was a little bit triggered by John's question earlier in terms of the gridding of the roads. I was reminded about my time in Belfast City Council and gridding of the Cumber Greenway. Um, and that was something that Danny will be aware of, I was always raising, because 
as an East Belfast councillor at that time, you know, I would constantly get contacted about people that have slipped on the Greenway um, because it's not gridded currently and it is DFI ownership. Any conversations about maybe trying to include that in terms of monitoring round bid, but also in terms of transference to the local councils? I know that's something that's been bandied around for a while. Um. We, we, we do we do consider it and we, we talk about it from time to time but we don't have a current plan to grit the Cumber Greenway um, it, the, the way we grit the roads we only grit 28% of the roads that carry most of the traffic so lower traffic roads don't get gritted the traffic volumes on the Cumber Greenway if they were to be treated simply in the same way as a road wouldn't justify inclusion in the gritting programme but appreciate it as a different type of, of service and it's used for different purposes we would need, we would need additional equipment and we would need a different methodology, so it wouldn't be a matter of taking our existing gritting and just adding it in. Obviously, it's narrower, it needs different access, but the type of salt that we would use would have to be different. Um, the salt we use relies on heavy traffic grinding it into the surface to be effective, and you wouldn't get that on the Cumber Greenway at all, and particularly on a cold, icy morning where fewer people would be uh, tempted to, to use it. Um, but we recognise the value it would have, and we have done some work to improve the usability of the Greenway, so the lighting scheme that was installed last year, for example, to try and extend the period of time that people can use it, um, but we don't yet have a proposal for gridding. No final questions from me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, I do have some final questions. Um, the gritting again and, and the monitoring rounds, that seems a bit crazy to me that you know you would have to do it through monitoring rounds rather than that be a basic. How long has that been happening for? Oh, that's pretty much always Never. been the case. Right, okay. Yeah, we've, we've always had the, the bit in, in your... It's, it, it's, it's a point of interest to me, certainly when I joined the department, that the department doesn't have a legal obligation to grit the roads. Mm -hmm. It has a legal obligation to clear snow and yeah. to maintain the roads, but specifically not to grit the roads and remove ice. So um, that, that's part of the, the picture as well. But you know, leaving aside the, the legal technicality, we know instantly that if we don't grit the roads, we have a significant issue and the transport network doesn't function and so many other things don't function as a result of that. Um, so as I say, we've always been able to, to re-divert the money, um, even though it hasn't been in the baseline. And it's an interesting point um, and I suppose for me something that has come up and I'm sure it's maybe come up as members and I'm just interested to know the, the reason and I suppose around it is obviously at the minute we have resurfacing schemes um, that are going to be happening and I know in my area there's been uh, quite a few and speaking to my local section who are absolutely <laughs> fabulous they are brilliant on the ground in terms of any of the issues that I have to raise. Um, road closures and road maintenance can really get people irate. <laughs> um, and particularly if that is in a town, um, a smaller town, um, and I'm thinking of towns in my areas where there is, you're, you're literally going through what I classify as back roads if the town is, is closed off for road um, maintenance schemes, they don't close them off with the enclosure and sometimes that can make it very, very difficult. Um, and I'm thinking of my own constituency where there is no motorways, <laughs> there, there's very little dual carriageway and so motorway traffic has to come through certain towns. Is that a sectional decision that's made or is that a policy at a higher level and is those road closures to get the work done quicker and therefore reduce the cost of a project and is that why we're seeing more road closures for road maintenance projects rather than a lane closure in places? Well, it, it it very much depends. Is it's there, it's not that it's there's a particular policy around it. The the need for road closures is very much depending on the the health and safety both of the travelling public and equally our staff and contractors that work on the road network. Um, there are always a lot of very detailed discussions between our our traffic sections and our contractors and our maintenance teams around minimising the disruption to to road users. But equally, giving enough time to be able to actually get get a scheme complete. Um, we we are not the only ones that work on the road network. Utilities are as well. 
are, there are thousands of road um, closures um, throughout the year. Um, and it is that balance of minimising disruption but maintaining safety and being able to get the work complete where we can. Uh, if a road does have to be closed, we, we will do what we can to divert the, the shortest, most appropriate um, diversion route that, that is possible. But, but I recognise equally people will find their own way and, and will end up on, on some roads that aren't necessarily you know, appropriate for that level of traffic. It's just unfortunately, and and you know, I've just seen an increase, I suppose, in in my area of you know road closures, and sadly, in some circumstances, because of the rural nature of our roads um, and motorway traffic coming through, unfortunately, it's led to fatalities, very sadly, um, and you know, it's it's about trying to minimise some of those impacts as well, um, and. And I hope that that's something that can be taken away and, and looked at um, from your perspective um, because it, it has caused quite a few um, issues, I know, in my own constituency. Uh, the vice chair is indicating, but I have one last question <laughs> on, <chestnut. laughs> on, 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 on the street lights. Um, and I just wanted to check about the LED lighting because there has been some issues in relation to wildlife that has cropped up and how you mitigate that. Um, whilst we love to see improvements and whilst you're saying that that's brilliant for cost saving, there is the impact on, on wildlife as well. So how are you balancing that? Yeah, in terms of those designs of those, of, of those particular schemes, yes, environmental considerations is, is, a, is a key part of that assessment process. And the impact on biodiversity is something that we're, we're very mindful of in, in terms of those things. So, yes, those are, are key parts of the, the design of those. And, and there have been particular incidents in, in certain locations where we have had perhaps to go back and perhaps redesign or re. Uh, refit um, certain aspects where maybe there were um, uh, an adverse impact in terms of some of the bi biodiversity things, but it is something that is very mindful within the, 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 the design process. So the example I would offer you is the Cumber Greenway again, where I don't know if, if you've ever had the chance to, to see the Cumber Greenway lit. Um, it, we use a red bulb, a red spectrum lighting that's, that's easier for the wildlife and has a less of an impact on wildlife. Um, while still maintaining some degree of lighting now, it's not lit like this. Yeah. It, it's obviously, it's different, but um, it can be used as the point. And so we do take that into consideration when designing schemes. Okay. Uh, I started it. Everyone question. almost got five final questions. So I don't know. It's only right probably that I got a final, final question. I am down for a final <laughs> You've been very generous for your time, folks, and, yeah. and I want to thank you for that. Um, one point and one question, Colin mentioned about utility companies. I mean, they are doing your cause no favours. I think some of the resurfacing jobs that they're doing, I don't want to name and shame them here, but they look like they've been done blindfolded in terms of the quality of the work that's finished. And invariably, and I know there's meant to be a minimum standard that's done to, but invariably, your good staff are having to go back out and redo those because those multi-million pound utility companies are not doing them anywhere near the standard they need to be done. So I think something drastic needs to be looked at how that, that is done. And the question is around a three-year budget. I think we really need to get to a three-year budget cycle so that your department and every other department can properly plan. I'm interested in this, just to tease out maybe how beneficial that could be to you in terms of strategic planning going forward. In term it would be immensely beneficial. Um, it, it's one of those potential big changes that you can envisage. Yeah. Um, it would be lovely to think we might get an extra two billion to spend on the road network, but in the absence of that, knowing three years out what we are going to get yeah. would, would make a real difference. So we, we would certainly welcome that. Okay, yeah. and I'm just going to call, call Mark in and then I, I think I will try and call him <laughs> today because we have, we have ran over on time and uh, members, we were very keen to try and get uh, some answers to some of our questions. So, Mark? It was just a wee supplementary to yours on the streetlights uh, chair and it was to ask what sort of scope there was to adjust them for brightness, colour, etc. I know there have been issues raised by people on occasion with sensory issues as well about the, the impact of the new LED lights and then where the Lucas Aid lights didn't seem to phase them as much. And you had made the point earlier when you were you, you were talking uh, and, and said that you weren't taking lights out to save money, but 
at the same time, I think he says you're choosing in places not to replace lights at the same moment. So, you know, colleagues will, will know more about, about the history of some of this, but a lot of those light fittings were put in when roads and street lighting was the responsibilities of other people, um, you know, particularly local government. And we're talking quite some time ago, so a light fitting could be there that, that isn't in compliance with our policy. Our policy would say you don't need to light that area. Now, we don't go around taking those out, but when they come to the end of their natural life and they either need to be replaced in order to continue to operate safely, at that point, if the policy does not support the need for lighting there, we wouldn't typically replace it. Um, that, that's, that's the distinction there. And just on, the, on their other point in terms of the standards of the light, or the, the types of light and the degree to which they're doing, obviously our design um, process takes account of, of, of standards of light and provision and those, those types of light and levels and, and brightness and things are, are key part of that, that design consideration as well. I will let you in, but you Thanks, have sir. to be very quick I really quick appreciate and it. I, I'm, I feel sorry for Stephen because the North Down is now top of the league in potholes. Arm, I was like that for 40 years. <laughs> but, um, just, just want to ask you a question. You may be able to answer the North West and East Link roads in Arm, No. Um, so, the prioritisation of major road schemes that was published last year indicated that those schemes were paused. Um, simply because there isn't the money to deliver them. Well, not simply, but partly because there isn't the money to deliver them. So obviously the Minister will, will be reviewing that decision. We we intend to bring him a, a review of that that allows him to consider his prioritisation. Um, I, I would say that unless there's all of a sudden an awful lot of extra money, then by the time we do the flagships, the city deals, the things that already have a funding stream, there may not be an awful lot of money left for other schemes. But obviously that's, that's part of the debate he'll need to have. And ask the question. Well, we we use starlight. By the way, we don't have LED lights. We we use the night sky to, to get round our the environment. The church has so many questions asked. I was going to make a joke around wise men, but I think we'll leave that one. Um, look, I just want to thank you very very much because we we have taken up a, a bit more time than than uh, I'm sure you were expecting, but an awful lot of questions, as I'm sure you can understand, um, and I do appreciate the work that does go on on the ground and you will have heard the members say how thankful they are for the teams that are on the ground so if you can feed that back um, we'd be really grateful if you could do that okay. um, and as I say uh, said at the start we're looking forward to working with you no doubt we'll have you before the committee again um, and I just want to thank you for your time today so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay, members, um, if you're content, I just think we'll just continue rattling on if you're content. All right. Um, obviously, we've asked a range of questions there and it was interesting to get some of the answers in relation to, to some of the um, questions that have been raised. Um, are you happy that we write to the department? There were some issues that maybe just weren't covered, you would have seen in the clerk's brief as well. Um, are you happy that we go back to them just on a few further points? Um, I think a point John raised, and it's a broad point, who polices the contractors? Where are there yeah. utilities? Well, that's mm -hmm. somebody digging a track, somebody spraying weeds or somebody cutting grass. There's umpteen issues that are getting paid to do the, the provide the, you know, the work, and they're not, they're not doing it to a standard. So, so what's the point in paying them to do it? Mm -hmm. yeah. and you, you, unfortunately, you need a policeman, I'll use that term. So it's, it's how they're managing all those contracts and mm -hmm. making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because fundamentally, the road breaks up, or, or the weeds don't die, yep. mm -hmm. or, the, or the people can't see it diverges, and they're getting paid to cut them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely Good money right. after bad. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and, and it's quite interesting, I found the, the, the street lighting issue was quite yeah. interesting, to be honest with you, because any time we had a site meeting, all the new developments, they weren't putting any, any more lighting right. in, and they're maintaining what they have. So it's it's a it's a big undertaking, mm -hmm. and and I've had some complaints obviously with the new LED lighting, but 
I mean, obviously, clearly, it's, it's it's new way forward, but maybe a wee bit more on that and the, the whole. Uh, the whole wee bit more on is it the policy? That I we but I, the, the whole see? what they have exactly the whole infrastructure and all. If if we haven't got that information already, yeah, in terms of street lighting. I could ask him literally around the criteria for yeah. Yeah. improving street lighting because I didn't know that was a consideration. Yeah. Um, so certainly we could follow up with the department on that. It would be. It would be. <coughs> I find it interesting. I think Mark, it was on the back of sort of a supplementary in relation to um, the said that some of the street lighting would have been under local government, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and it would be interesting to maybe get. The figures or the numbers of where those street lights are, because coming, you know, five years time, does that mean we're going to have more street lights taken away from areas because they have that consideration in place? I think what you find there, it's it's where the local government <coughs> had a different policy. Yeah. And I don't know geographically across different towns, villages. It's it. My experience would suggest it's where they would have let back squares, yeah. car parks, as opposed to actual carriageways and, yeah. and, and yeah. roads. That they see them now as superfluous, whereas they've played a vital role in community safety. And, and well, that's yeah. exactly yeah. the point. You know, my concern would be coming down the track in a few. We'll start to see maybe the outworkings of that a wee bit more in terms of our communities because street safety and things like that out at night and one thing or another if it's developments or in a rural area like i outlined we might see that coming to the fore more so so it'd be good to get an idea of you know how many we're looking at um in terms of the infrastructure that's there was there any peter I just build on keith's point he was making i think yours keith was specifically about you know, grass verges and things like yeah. that but also in terms of um Whenever uh, some departments call out to do, you know, works in terms of water or gullies, um, this was raised to me recently, and, and sometimes the work by the contractor of the footways and repairing to the original footway or the original carriageway isn't to the same standard that it was before. So kind of factor that in in terms of case points, yeah. in terms of who actually calls out to make sure that the footway or the road is repaired to the original reinstatement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the utility rig companies have a sort of a, a free reign. Yep. Mm -hmm. They dig up. I'm not saying they dig up what they want. They dig up what they need, but they don't replace it the way it is. And if you if you do a road crossing yourself to put water across a road to it in the rural area, you have to maintain that road for a certain period of time, or you don't get your bond back. Yeah. Yeah. But but who, who who's challenging the, the, the utility guys in that? Well, that's that? going to become more pronounced as the overall standard of roads yeah. <laughs> has yeah. demolished. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that is, so that's an improvement. Yeah, well, <laughs> <almost. laughs> yeah. Fill up holes, whatever. Right? I'm just going sure. to bring. It might just be worth stating you heard officials talk about the difference between a temporary repair yes. and the more expansive. We're, we're going to repair this; it's going to be permanent. I think that's where the issue with the utility companies opening up comes in. They're doing what really is a temporary repair; therefore, it's not going to be up to standard until a resurfacing of that area happens. It's like temporary rain in your own home. Temporary can turn into permanent. Absolutely, and, and that's where the disjoint probably is in terms of policy. I think one of the other frustrations we see too, there's nothing worse than seeing a new development or a new road get in and three weeks later the gas company come along and dig it up. Yeah. Where is the forward planning to say, can we please find out if anyone's any plans in the next year to do this before we spend a million pounds fixing the road or doing a brand new scheme? Yeah. It's, t it's bonkers. Yeah. I don't know. It no, it is at my lovely public realm <laughs> scheme locally that yeah, exact same thing happened. Purpose, yeah. um, and it was a real frustration, I have to say, because I uh, obviously digged up nice, lovely new cur curbin, mm -hmm. um, So, and it hasn't been replaced to the same standard, and it looks it looks awful. We could tease that out, Chair. Case points are well made. I think yeah. everyone agrees on that one. Well. We should get them back on again. <laughs> <laughs> You'd spend a week with them. I felt the same, to be yeah. honest, with North Garnet Water last yeah. week. Um, but our members can tell. Is there anything you want to add? Um, no, Chair. I think we. I think well, we can get a, an idea of the yeah. sort of the oversight upon completion of work. She said you could have them there for four hours, yeah. to be honest, but I got uh, a lot out of it. And, and as I said, they're going to be coming back on the 8.1 million Excellent. in terms of a breakdown for the area um, in, in terms of getting that breakdown as well, being useful. 
Okay, so if you're happy enough, we'll, we'll proceed on then. Um, so item agenda eight is the subordinate legislation, SL1s not subject to assembly procedure. So advise members that there are nine proposals for statutory rules that are not subject to assembly proceedings. A list summary, summarising the statutory rules is a page 267 of members' packs and the rules from uh, pages... 269 to 294. So at page 268, it's the SL1, the school's part time 20 mile per hour speed limit amendment order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will extend the existing part time 20 mile per hour speed limit at Concession Road, Con Lake, Cross McGlam. Um, at pages 271, SL1, the parking placements on roads and waiting restrictions, Newry Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will introduce a no waiting at any time restriction, loading and unloading permitted on a length of road at Clanry Avenue, Newry. A page 274, SL1, the prohibitation of right hand turn port start order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will prohibit vehicles proceeding in a southeasterly direction along Harbour Place, Port Sturt. At page 277, SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, London Dairy Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will prohibit vehicles waiting at any time, loading and unloading permitted on a length of road at Spruce Meadows, London Dairy. At page 280, SL1, the prohibition of right-hand turn in a skillin order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will prohibit vehicles proceeding in a westerly direction along the Dublin Road in a skillin. At page 283, SL1, the road races, Circuit of, Ra Circuit of Ireland rally order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will permit the suspension of the right-of-way of traffic on Saturday the 30th of March 2024 on certain roads within County Armagh and County Tyrone to facilitate the Ulster Rally. At page 285, SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions, OMA amendment order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will introduce a no waiting at any time restriction, loading and unloading permitted on lengths of the High Street and Scar Century, OMA. Vehicles are accepted from the the restriction in certain circumstances. At uh, page eight, 288, uh, SL1, the parking and waiting restrictions in a skill and amendment order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will authorise lengths of new street in a skill and for use as parking places and prescribed under what conditions they may be used and prohibit vehicles waiting at any time, loading and unloading. Uh, at page 291, SL1, the parking places on roads and waiting restrictions, Coal Island order, Northern Ireland 2024. The proposed rule will authorise measures which are necessary to facilitate changes arising from the implementation of the Mid-Ulster District Council Public Realm Scheme within the town. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Content? content yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item nine, the SL1, the back street at Botanic Avenue and Donegal Pass, Belfast, abandonment order, Northern Ireland 2024. A page 296 is the SL1. <coughs> this rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 58 square metres of superseded road extending from Ratcliffe Street, Belfast, to the rear of number 12, Botanic Avenue, Belfast. The abandonment has been requested by Manor Property Developments Limited, who are the owners of the bed and soil of the site. Following the abandonment, uh, TRAM Eastern colleagues advise that the land, the area of land, will revert back to the landowner. The abandonment will enable redevelopment work at the site to proceed. I seek agreement from members that they are content with the proposal for the statutory rule at this stage. Then. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, it's back. <laughs> All right. Um, agenda ten. <laughs> <laughs> Don't record that. That's not in the at all. 
<laughs> I was going to say something there a lot. Um, item 10 is the SL1, the Bayhead Road, Port Ballantyre, Abandonment Order, in Northern Ireland, 2024, and at page 300 is the SL1. The rule is subject to negative resolution in reg reg negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The purpose of the rule is to abandon an area of 37.9 square metres of footway in front of number 52 Bayhead Road, Port Ballantyre. I'm seeking uh, mem that members are content with the proposal uh, for the statutory rule at this stage. All members content? Yep. Item 11 is SL1 Beachfield Drive, Donica D, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2024, and at page 305 is the SL1. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 50 square metres of road fronting numbers 34, 36 and 38 Beachfield Drive, Donica D. I'm seeking that members are content with the proposal for the statutory rule at this stage. All members content? Yeah. Item 12 is SL1 Carrick Manon Road, Cross Gar Abandonment Order, North Ireland 2024 and at page 305 is SL1. This rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 231 square metres of superseded road at Carcamanon Road Cross Gar, commencing at a point 26 metres east of its junction with Manch Road and continuing for a distance of 35 metres in a northerly direction. I'm seeking that members are content with the proposal for the statutory rule at this stage. All members content? content. And item 13 is SL1, the Gilmore Street, Ballymena Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2024. At page 313 is SL1. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the Assembly. The rule will abandon an area of 10 square metres of road which lies within the property at 8 to 10 Gilmore Street, Ballymena. Again, I'm seeking members are content with the proposal for the statutory rule at this stage. All members content? Okay, so that brings us on to our forward work programme. So uh, members will see that on page 317 is the draft forward work programme. Um, I advise members just that the work programme will be updated obviously to reflect any decisions taken today. Um, and I want to seek agreement to schedule an oral briefing with the Assembly's Research and Information Service to um, info this will help us to inform ourselves um, for the evidence session with the Minister on the 13th of March. So are members content that that briefing is scheduled in advance of the Minister coming in? Yep. Yeah. And um, I'm just seeking agreement to proceed with the briefings as set out in the draft forward work programme. So are members content? Yeah. yeah. And I think next week we have um, DFI's climate planning and public transport of the DVLA coming in uh, next week. So, and then we've the DFI's water um, and departmental delivery. So, um, there's a look at rivers and flooding. So we've got quite a big a um, agenda next week. So just on that point, Chair, yeah, they're also going to touch on the high-level financials that the committee had asked. Yep. So um, it will give us uh, an indication of the department's financial position for this year and in, into next year as well, um, with a more substantive briefing a little bit further down. Chair, um, I don't know, possibly I missed it last week. Did we get a response back from Transnet regarding a visit to the hub? Oh, the hub. Um, that, that detail is still being worked through for our forward work programme. The committee agreed that we would, now that the recess date being confirmed, we would look to doing that into after the Easter recess period. Um, so actually, um, Johnny's actually just working weekend. through on that at the yeah. moment to identify okay. a mutually convenient, convenient date. But naturally, we, the hope is that we'll have the, the draft forward work program in front of members on the 13th of March. Yep. Um, so it should give you an idea of how that's looking okay. with a view to refining that as required. Great. Okay, all members content then? Mm -hmm. And uh, just item agenda 15, any other business? I just for, forgot to mention, um, obviously last week we discussed about TransLink and there is the Minister's response in relation to 
um, the pay yeah. issues obviously will welcome the fact that things have progressed mm -hmm. um, over the weekend and hopefully a solution is now found in relation to um, some of the pay issues that were going on for uh, the TransLink staff. So are all members content with the um, ministers? You're, you're happy enough. And any other items of business that anybody wanted to raise? All content? content. Okay, so that brings us in to the date, time and location of the next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on the on sorry, the 6th of March um, in room 29, Parliament Building. So thank you, everybody, for today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And I'll now adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Committee Room 29. Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound. Committee Room 29, Sound. <phone rings> Committee Room 29, Sound.
Committee Room 29, signed. 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 Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed. Committee Room 29, signed.
Committee Room 29, Sound. 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 Committee Room 29, Sound.